So in the last lecture, we finished off looking at a, a kind of very naive matrix multiplication algorithm. So what I want to do now is look at a matrix multiplication algorithm that takes advantage of the cache, and specifically a cache oblivious algorithm. So the particular algorithm that we're going to consider is the one in this particular paper here. It's called RecMult in that paper. So just to be consistent with the terminology they use, I'll call it by the same name. So this is the particular algorithm we're going to look at. It's maybe not quite correct to call it just matrix multiplication. It's really a multiply and accumulate. So effectively what you do is you give it like an M by N matrix A, an M by P matrix B, and an M by P matrix C. Basically the sizes are chosen such that matrix multiplication is well-defined. But it doesn't just compute A times B. It takes A times B and then adds it to C. So it's, it's maybe more correct to call it a, a multiply accumulate. It's basically multiplying and then accumulating it to some already existing result. But of course, we can use this to achieve matrix multiplication if we want, because we can initialize C to zero before we basically execute this line here, in which case, effectively, what we're doing is just matrix multiplication. Um, there's other ways we can modify the algorithm, so it just kind of directly does matrix multiplication. But just so that I can follow exactly what's presented in their paper, I'll present it in this particular way. So as we'll see as we look at this in a little bit more detail, this particular approach, it's based on a divide and conquer strategy. And essentially what it does, we have sort of three dimensions that are of relevance. There's M, N, and P, which are the various numbers, rows, and columns, and so on of the various matrices involved. And essentially what we do is we pick the largest of the three dimensions, the largest of M, N, and P, and then we split the matrices along that dimension. Uh, so there's basically three cases to consider in the algorithm, because when we ask which of M, N, and P is largest, there's kind of three possibilities. M might be largest, N might be largest, or P might be largest. And we have a case for handling each one of those. In some cases, you may have a tie. Like, for example, if the matrices are all square that you're multiplying, then M equals N equals P. So when we're saying which is largest, we basically just flip a coin. You can handle it with any one of the three cases because M and P are all the largest. Uh, anyway, so on the subsequent slide, in the three cases we consider when some of these values are equal, you can just flip a coin to break the tie. It doesn't particularly matter which one you choose. So essentially, we have three cases, again, which correspond to the first case is when M is the largest of M, N, and P. Uh, second case is when N is largest. And then the third case is when P is largest. So M corresponds to the number of rows in A and C. Uh, so in this particular case, um, if M is the largest, what we want to do is we want to split both A and C along the, the rows. Uh, so we're going to split C in, in this, so such that it's partitioned in this way basically splitting along the, the larger dimension, which in this case is the number of rows. And also we do a similar thing for A. And effectively what we do is we rewrite the product of A times B as in terms of subblocks. We have A1 times B and then A2 times B. So the overall result of A times B is written as kind of two uh, subblock based uh, matrix multiplies. And then effectively what we do is we we then did this uh, first block here, A1 times B is the value that we want to add to C1 basically this part up here. And then the second part here, A2 times B, is what we want to add to C2, because again, we're doing like a multiply and accumulate. So this leads to these two kind of sub problems that we recurse on. Uh, C1 is C1 plus A1 times B, and then C2 is C2 plus A2 times B. And then we basically recurse. And each time we, we do this, the problem size goes down, because we're always dividing along the, the size of the M, N, and P, which is biggest. Um, of course, it might not be the case that M is the largest, maybe N is the largest. And if you look at the previous slide, essentially N corresponds to the number of columns in A and also the number of rows in B. Um, so this is a case where the number of columns in A or, and the number of rows in B is largest. So in this case, we split A along its lo longest dimension and we split B along its longest dimension as well. And effectively, what we do is we rewrite the product of A times B in terms of two kind of block submatrices. We have A1 times B1 plus A2 times B2. In other words, we partition things in this way, and if we multiply these together, what we end up with is this right-hand side here. Uh, so effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to compute this kind of accumulation of the result product of AB into C. We're going to do this in two steps. So first, we compute A1 times B1 and then accumulate this into C, and then we compute A2 times B2, and then we accumulate this into C. And it doesn't really matter which order we accumulate them. Addition, you can do in either order. And then in case three, this is corresponds to uh, P being the largest of M, N, and P. And P, if you look at the previous slide, it corresponds to the number of columns in B and C. So what we're going to do is we're going to split along the columns in, in both B and C. So we split the C in this way, split B in this way. And effectively, we rewrite the product of A times B in the following way. We rewrite, rewrite it as a subblock, which is A times B1, and another subblock, which is A times B2. 
And then this part here, A times B1, is what we're going to be adding to C1. So we end up with C1 is equal to C1 plus AB1. And then AB2 here is what's going to be added to C2. And then we recurse on, on this as well. So essentially what happens in each of these cases, what we're doing is we're always splitting along the largest dimension of MN and T. Because of this, we're always forcing the size of the problem to go down. And because of this, eventually it's going to go down to a one by one. Uh, you know, MN and P will all eventually go to one because they keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Um, and eventually if things go down to a one by a one case, so in other words, uh, M and P are all one, then effectively what we have is scalar multiplication. We have like a one, one, one by one matrix times a one by one matrix, which is basically just multiplying two numbers, two scalars. So this becomes kind of trivial in the case that M and P are equal to one. So this is the basic idea on which this is based. Any questions? Um, so conceptually, we recurse until MN and P are all one, but in practice, we wouldn't normally recurse this deeply. The, the reason why is that as we're recursing, the, the number of recursive function calls starts to grow expen exponentially as we're sort of going down the recursion tree. But at the same time, the amount of processing we're doing in each of those function calls is, is decreasing kind of exponentially. So we very quickly reach a point where you're doing a massive number of function calls that do almost nothing. And then the overhead of the function calls becomes kind of problematic. Uh, it starts to eat up a lot of time. So for this reason, we typically don't recurse all the way sort of down to M, e M equal N equal P equal one. Uh, but in, conceptually, you can imagine that this is kind of how things work. In practice, we would stop with the problem being a little bit larger and then just kind of brute force do the matrix multiplication at that point. So I have some examples to help illustrate this uh, particular algorithm. Uh, and I'm using this kind of plus equals notation just to denote we're doing like a multiply accumulate. So we're essentially like multiplying these two matrices together and then adding them to this other matrix here. So this is what this uh, plus equals kind of notation means, just kind of following C++ kind of syntax. Um, so in this particular case, this uh, what we have is, uh, well, essentially M and P, I guess, are all two. Um, so it doesn't really matter which which case we choose. But in this particular case, I've chosen to split A in this way and then split C in the corresponding way. So effectively, what's going to happen here is the left subproblem, like the subproblem associated with this left node here, is going to correspond to this top row of, of the C matrix plus the top row of this A matrix times this whole entire B matrix. So this is how we get this left problem here. And then the right subproblem is going to correspond to the bottom row in this matrix, the bottom row in this matrix, and then this whole matrix here. So this is what we have here. And then this process just kind of keeps recursing. So if we go down and consider this problem here, um, in this case, we're going to split again along the longer dimension. So we're splitting C in this particular way and then splitting B in a corresponding way. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the left subproblem is going to consist of C11. In other words, the left side of this array, uh, all of A, so both, both of these entries, and then the, uh, the left column of B. So this is what we have here. And then the right subproblem over here is going to co consist of the right part of the C matrix, all of the A matrix, and then the right part of the B matrix. And then we recurse again. And what you can see is that if we keep recursing, eventually things are gonna go to all one by one matrices, which is what happens here. So if you recurse to one more level, um, where we're gonna split basically a, a lot, split A and B, so splitting A in this way and splitting B in this way. And then effectively what happens, uh, the left side problem is gonna be C11, and then the left side of this row and then the top entry in this column here, so that gives us this. And then the right problem is going to again be C11, the right side of this entry here, and then the bottom entry from this particular matrix here. And at this point, this just becomes scalar multiplication. We just have you know a real number plus equals, and then the product of two real numbers. So this becomes kind of a trivial exercise. You don't need to need, need to know how to do matrix multiplication at this point. Uh, but again, in practice, we don't typically go all the way down to one by one kind of problems. We'd stop a little bit further up in the tree. Um, for the way that the, the for the particular example that we have here, there's not really any benefit probably to using some kind of cache conscious sort of algorithm, um, like one that kind of tries to take caching into effect in some way, because the, the problem is only a two by two matrix. So it probably is going to fit in, in any cache on any system. So no matter what you do, you're going to probably not end up with any cash misses. But for this to kind of be more practically useful, you can imagine that this tree has many levels in it, like you're dealing with a much larger matrix. Obviously, for practical reasons, I can't put like a, a 1024 by 1024 matrix at the top of the tree and then draw the whole tree. It's, it's not ever going to fit. But if you think of it in those terms, then it makes sense potentially to use an approach like this. 
And essentially part of what leads to the efficiency in this algorithm is you'll notice that if you pick any arbitrary node in this, this tree, like for example, if we pick this node here, all of the descendants of this node are only processing the data that's associated with this node here. So because of this, we get a certain locality that's sort of baked into the, the particular structure of this uh, tree that we have here. Um, so part of this is what leads to kind of more, uh, more locality in terms of the memory access. Is the other thing is effectively when we're doing this algorithm, we're doing like a depth first traversal of the tree. So when you sort of combine that with the fact that there's a certain locality in the sense that a node, all of the descendants of a node are operating on data that's associated with that node. If you combine that with a depth first traversal of the tree, you end up visiting things in a very efficient order with respect to the cache. You're kind of staying very local and you're kind of maximally using, utilizing data before it gets stale and tossed out of the cache. So this is the basic idea on which this particular scheme works. And in terms of pseudocode, I have some pseudocode to go along with this just to show uh, kind of how the algorithm might look in terms of code. Um, essentially what we have is a, a recursive function called matrix multiply and, and as inputs it basically takes some part of the A matrix that you're dealing with, some part of the B matrix that you're dealing with and some part of the C matrix where at the very top of the recursion it's the whole matrix A, the whole matrix B, the whole matrix C. But then what happens is the, the function might look something like this where you check to see first of all uh, are the sizes of A and B and C small enough where you have some kind of terminating a terminating condition for the recursion. You could let it go all the way down to one by one, but in practice we would stop with a little bit larger array than, arrays than that. But you have some criterion for stopping, and if you reach that point, you just use you know some probably very straightforward algorithm just to compute the, the matrix product. Maybe not necessarily worrying too much about the cache because the problem is small enough that probably everything fits in the cache anyway. Uh, otherwise, if the problem is not small enough, then essentially what we do is we recursively call ourselves to handle the the left side and the like the left subchild in the tree and the right subchild in the tree. And the rest is just kind of bookkeeping. We just have to figure out, well, given that we want to process the left side of the tree, what's the new part of A that we're processing? What's the new part of B and what's the new part of C? And I've denoted these with primes just to mean that they're not the same as the original parts that we we're dealing with. And then I have double primes here to denote the, the parts of the A, B and C matrix that we're processing for the right sub problem. So the, the code, the only place where really work is happening is just in the base case for the recursion. Everything else is effectively just bookkeeping to keep track of what part of A, B, and C are you actually dealing with. So that when you actually get to applying the, the actual matrix multiplication in the base case, you know what part you need to operate on. Any questions? And there's another example here if you want to go through, but it's just kind of more of the same thing. So I'll spare you the pain of listening to me talk about it, but it's a little bit bigger, the matrices. So you might want to go through it as well if, you're, if you just want some additional practice. Uh, so in terms of the performance of this particular algorithm, uh, you'll notice that for these cache oblivious algorithms, I'm not going into any detail to actually drive the, the number of cache misses and so on in terms of asymptotic analysis. That's kind of beyond the scope of the course. Um, I just wanted to introduce the idealized cache model so that when I say like the results that were obtained for the number of cache misses and there's this asymptotic result, I can say in a meaningful way it's assuming the idealized cache model. So you know what the assumptions are that the result was based on, but you're not responsible for like deriving the result. It's, it's quite involved and it's not really the point of the course so much. Uh, so in terms of uh, notation on this slide, so we're assuming or we're defining L to be the number of uh, number of matrix elements that are held in a single cache block. And then the M is the size of the cache in, in matrix elements. And if we multiply an M by N matrix by an M by P matrix, which is effectively what this algorithm is doing, the amount of work that's required is MNP, which sort of makes sense for a matrix multiply. This is essentially what we need in terms of work to solve this type of problem. But the more interesting thing is really the, the cache misses that we can incur. So this is the result that I'm, I'm completely skipping over how it was derived and so on, because it's not really the point of this course. If this was a computer science course, maybe they would go into this in a lot of detail, uh, but this is not really the point here. Um, but you end up with this expression here, this kind of ugly looking thing here. This is a number of cache misses you can expect, assuming that the cache is being modeled with this idealized model that I introduced in an earlier lecture. And if we let M and N, N and sorry, if you let M and N and P be equal, in other words, you're multiplying two square matrices, then these formulas here just simplify into order N cube work. And then the number of cache misses is order this expression here. And again, this is assuming an idealized cache model. And it's been shown that this particular bound is sort of optimal. So in other words, this is kind of the, the best that you can hope to do. 
at least in the asymptotic sense. So this particular uh, cache oblivious algorithm improves a great deal on the naive approach that we talked about to begin with. It gets much better performance in terms of reducing the number of cache misses and so on. Any questions? Uh, what I want to do at this point is just revisit this cache oblivious matrix multiplication algorithm, but look at the situation that we, what happens if we want to do just a matrix multiply, but not a multiply and accumulate? I mean, we can always achieve the, the matrix multiplication in terms of a multiply accumulate operation by simply setting the initial value to zero, and then we're accumulating into zero, and effectively we're just doing a matrix multiply. But we can actually tweak the algorithm as it was presented in the the uh, paper that I mentioned earlier, we can tweak the algorithm so that it actually directly just does matrix multiplication. We don't have to initialize the C matrix to zero. Um, so basically what I'm gonna describe is how we can modify the algorithm so that it will achieve this particular goal. Um, so what we're going to do is to add an additional piece of state to the recursion. In particular, we're going to add a Boolean flag that indicates whether we write the matrix product result into the destination for the result by accumulating that is adding to whatever is already there, or by assigning, that is overwriting whatever is there. If the accumulate flag is true, then we write to the destination by accumulating. If the flag is false, then we write to the destination by assigning. And then the uh, rules of the game go in the following way. Um, so let me just get this right here. Okay, I guess I described that bullet already. Um, so when we start the recursion, or when we're doing the recursion, I should say, we always do the left child first in the recursion and then the right child. So in the tree that we were looking at before, we always do the left child and then the right child. This is sort of the first thing, which is important. And when we start the recursion, we set the accumulate flag to false. And then effectively for the two case, like we had cases one, two, and three, so the numbering scheme is the same as the algorithm we just looked at a moment ago. So for cases one and three, the accumulate flag just remains the same. When I make the two recursive function calls, I pass the same accumulate flag that I was passed. So it's just kind of passed through. In the case that we're handling case two, the accumulate flag gets passed through unmodified when I make the function call for the left child. But for the right child, I set the flag to be true. And if I follow these rules, that's maybe not obvious at all, but if you kind of look at it in a lot more detail, if you follow these rules, because of the particular ordering that you're processing nodes and the particular way that you're manipulating this accumulate flag, this will have the end effect of um, kind of the very first time you're writing to the matrix, it, it, it directly writes the value. In other cases, it will add to what was there before, which is kind of the effect that you want. And I have a few examples. I'll skip over this one. I think there's one, yeah. So this example here, I'll, I'll just kind of briefly comment on. Um, this is probably not very legible, but actually I want to look at this anyway, a hard copy, which I've scribbled some annotations on. So this is just kind of showing, I've just labeled like what case of the case one, two, three is being used in each of the, the the nodes in the tree that we're processing. So the top of, at the very top of the recursive function call, in other words, corresponding to the root node here, we set this accumulation flag to be false. So we're not going to accumulate. And the way that I'm distinguishing between like accumulation versus assignment, in some of these cases, you'll see there's an equal sign. In other cases, you'll see there's like plus equal. So when there's an equal sign, it means I just take this result and overwrite, like directly write to the thing on the left-hand side. In the case that there's like a plus equals, like what we have here, it's saying that whatever result I compute on the right-hand side, it has to be accumulated basically added into the thing on the left hand side. So the only cases that are kind of interesting are the, the case twos because these are the cases where things uh, you don't just kind of pass through the particular accumulate flag that you were passed by the kind of your parent in the recursion tree. So for example here we, have, we start out just by luck it turns out this is case two that happens here. Uh, the particular way we're splitting here corresponds to case two. So what happens is when we make the function call to process this uh, sub block here, we pass through the accumulation flag. So it was a false initially, so this gets passed false. Therefore, it's just going to compute this result here and directly assign it to this matrix C. The right child, however, automatically gets the flag set. So the accumulate flag is set true for this. So basically when we're processing things underneath here, these are going to be accumulating. So here we have plus equals. And basically we just follow this rule that for like each case two in the diagram here, we we're careful to make sure that we always pass through the same accumulate flag. We were passed to our left child, like the left uh, function call that processes the left child, and the right child, we always set the flag to true. 
And we always call process the left child first, followed by the right child. And as long as we do this, it will have kind of the end effect that we want. And for this particular picture here, effectively what happens is these leaf nodes are sort of evaluated left to right. So we kind of evaluate these things going across here and then these nodes across here. And if you kind of work through and draw it on paper and so on, you'll, you can confirm that actually it does compute things in the order, adding in places where you want to add and just immediately assigning in places where you want to assign. And you actually will get the right result. Any questions? Oh, so and, and I'm going to skip over Strassen's algorithm. Perhaps if, if some of you are from computer, well, some of you are from computer science, you might have maybe covered this. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the discrete Fourier transform, uh, because this is a really important kind of computation in many signal processing algorithms. The DFT lies at the heart of many signal processing uh, algorithms. Uh, so it's something that we might very much be interested in computing efficiently. Uh, so for those of you who are maybe from more like electrical engineering kind of background and so on, had courses in signal processing, I'm sure you're quite painfully familiar with the DFT. I'm sure they would have covered that in the signal processing course. Um, for those of you maybe from other backgrounds, it's not a big deal if you don't really know what the DFT is. I mean, maybe it's helpful to appreciate um, like why you might care about it if you've used it before, but it's, it's basically just some math formulas. You can look at it abstractly if you like. If you haven't had any background, it's not a really big deal. Um, Anyway, like mathematically, uh, we have like a sequence or basically a vector of numbers, a vector x of n complex numbers, and we can compute what's called a discrete Fourier transform of this vector of n complex numbers, which is another vector of n complex numbers. And the formula for computing the, the elements in this, uh, these, the matrix y is, or the vector y is given by this formula here, where this quantity of mega subscript n is basically an nth root of unity, like an nth root of square root or nth root of one, effectively. Um, what we can do is we can take the, the computation of the DFT and we can rewrite it in the way which is shown here. Uh, what we've effectively done is we've taken the size of the vector that we're trying to compute the DFT for, like the number of points in the DFT that we're computing, and we factored it into n1 and n2, where n1 and n2 are integers. They're required to be integers. And then we can rewrite the formula up above in this particular way here. And effectively what we have here, if we look much more carefully at it, we actually have two nested DFTs. Like the inner summation corresponds to a DFT and the outer summation corresponds to a DFT as well. So effectively this kind of motivates a particular way in which we could compute the DFT, which is that, um, and also maybe another thing that's done here as well is effectively we're kind of viewing this vector, the initial vectors X and Y that we were given, we're viewing them sort of as if they were two dimensional arrays because we're doing indexing with two indexing variables here because we split this into two summations. We're effectively kind of indexing things as if they were two dimensional arrays, although the data itself is one dimensional. But we're just saying, well, we'll treat the data as if it was laid out in two dimensions. And effectively, we do, what we, if we do this, what we end up with is this particular formula here leads to an approach where we compute the DFT by first of all computing um, N2 DFTs of size N1, which corresponds to the inner summation here, the one in the parentheses. Um, then we multiply the result by what's referred to as a twiddle factor. This thing here is called a twiddle factor. It's just basically some root, root of uh, unity uh, raised to some power. And then we have this outer summation, which is the DFT. So then we compute another N1 DFTs of size N2. So the inner and outer summations are, are doing different. The number of points in the DFT is different. And the, the number of DFTs we have to compute is different as well. Anyways, any questions so far? OK. So the particular uh, cache oblivious fast Fourier transform algorithm we're going to talk about is referred to as the, well, at least sometimes it's referred to as the six step variant of the Cooley Tukey FFT algorithm. Um, and the basic algorithm works in the following way. So we have an, an array called X, which has N elements in it. So we have basically N complex numbers in the, in the array X. And we're going to compute the FFT of these values. The, the steps in the algorithm are as follows. So the first thing we do is we take N which by definition is an integer, and we factor it into two integers, n1 and n2. And ideally, we want to choose n, n1 and n2 to be like equal to the square root of n, but statistically speaking, it's very unlikely that the square root of n is going to be an, an integer value. So in a lot of cases, we'll have to kind of 
choose something close to the square root of n, but we can't do this exactly. Otherwise, we're going to end up with non-integer values, which wouldn't make sense because these here are going to be like dimensions of arrays and so on. So they need to be integers. Uh, then what we do next is we treat our vector x as like the input to this algorithm is effectively just a one-dimensional array. It's a, it's a vector. Uh, we're going to treat this as a two-dimensional array that's stored in row major order, which has n1 rows and n2 columns. So there's no computation involved here. This is just a matter of perspective. We say there's this array, this chunk of memory, it, it, as it's being passed into us in this algorithm at the input, it's just in a, a one-dimensional array. But we're going to say, I don't care what it really is. I'm going to pretend that it's a two-dimensional array and just view it differently. We're not actually changing any, moving anything around in memory. It's just a matter of perspective. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply uh, our matrix transpose algorithm. For example, we could use the cache oblivious transpose algorithm we talked about before to transpose this matrix. And we're going to transpose it in place so we can do this by, because the particular algorithm we have can't transpose in place. What we can do is we can transpose into an auxiliary buffer and then copy the transpose matrix back. This is how we achieve doing the, the transposition in place. We're not really doing it in place. We're creating a temporary buffer, like an auxiliary buffer, transposing into it, and then copying the transpose result back to where we really want it. And then at this point, what we do is we then, for each of the rows in this, this particular array, we're going to replace the row by its DFT. So the number of points in the row, or like the number of elements in the row is N1, and the number of rows is N2. So we're going to effectively compute N2 DFTs, where each DFT involves N1 points because this is the number of elements in a row. And we do this recursively. So like this is when we're doing the DFT, then this whole algorithm starts up again in order to, to apply or to compute the DFT. Um, then what we do next is we multiply by these twiddle factors, and then we transpose the matrix again using a similar sort of strategy. And then we're going to, again, do DFTs along the rows of the matrix that we end up with. Again, we're just viewing this chunk of memory as a two-dimensional array. And when, because we transpose it, the number of rows and columns sort of reverse after we transpose. So now there's going to be n1 rows rather than n2. And the number of points in the DFT is going to be n2 rather than n1. And again, this is, this is applied recursively. So if we're doing this DFT computation, the DFT computation, we recursively invoke the DFT computation. And then when we're done, we do a transpose again. And effectively, what we do at the end is we say this thing that we're, we were viewing as a two-dimensional array, now let's just view it as a one-dimensional array. And that's our output data. Um, so maybe in terms of the picture that goes along with this, this might be kind of helpful. Um, so effectively, what we do is we take our value of n. Maybe I should zoom in a little bit here. So essentially, we take our n and we factor it into n1 and n2, and then we view this matrix as being an n1 by n2 matrix, like n1 rows, n2 columns. Then we transpose it, and we get this transpose matrix here, and then we're going to do a DFT, replace each row in this matrix by its DFT. So we do this here. Um, then we multiply the resulting matrix that we have, we multiply the elements by these twiddle factors, just as various constant factors, we multiply the different elements in the array by. Then we transpose the matrix again, and then we do the DFT along the rows, and then we transpose the matrix again. And then we say this thing that we've been calling a two, like a two-dimensional matrix, now let's view, view it as if it was a one-dimensional matrix, which is really what it is. It's like a one-dimensional output should be coming out of the algorithm, and that's our result. And the reason for these transposition operations is that when we're doing these DFTs, we want things to be accessed efficiently with respect to the cache. So we want because we're storing the, the, the matrices in in row major order, we want to walk along the rows. We don't want to go down the columns. Effectively, what we're doing here, because we're doing a DFT along the rows and then we transpose and then do a DFT along the rows again, the second time that we're doing the DFT, really what we're doing is the DFT down the columns because we tran the original columns is we transpose, right? But the reason why we transpose and don't just do DFT down the columns is if we did the DFT down the, down the columns, we're gonna be accessing memory with a large stride as we go down the column. So what we do is we transpose first, so all the data that we want is all in consecutive locations, and then do a, a DFT computation across the row. Uh, basically, this is the whole reason for doing all of these transpositions, is we always wanna get the data sitting along rows before we process it so that it will be in consecutive addresses which makes things much more efficient with respect to the cache. So this is the basic uh, kind of algorithm in terms of the picture. Any questions? So I want to go through uh, like some simple example to kind of illustrate how this all works. 
So first of all, I'll just point out that a two-point DFT is very easy to compute. If you plug into the formula from the earlier uh, slide, if you have a two-point DFT, in other words, a DFT where there's two elements in the input factor, the output is just the sum and the difference of those elements. So you make the formula uh, simplifies to a very, very simple result, which is this result here. And I'm just going to use this result in some of the subsequent uh, example that I want to go through, which is going to kind of break things down into two by two or two point DFTs. And then I can just use this formula here. So what I really want to consider in the example to go through, because two point DFT is a little bit too simple. I want to consider a uh, four point DFT. So we have four elements in this, this uh, array here that we want to compute the DFT for. Uh, so what we want to do again, we want to take N, the number of elements in this, uh, this vector, and we want to factor it into integer parts, keeping them as close as possible to the square root of n. In this case, things work out quite, kind of nicely because n is 4, so the square root of 4 actually is an integer. So we can actually choose this exactly. But again, in practice, often you have to choose them kind of close to the square root, but they're, one of the numbers will be a bit bigger than the other because things won't quite work out so nicely to get integer results in the factorization. And then the next thing, so how the algorithm starts out is we're first of all going to take this one-dimensional array that we've been given here, this vector, and we're going to treat it as if it was a two-dimensional array sto stored in row major order. So if this, if the data is stored in memory like x0, x1, x2, x3, and then we view this as a two-dimensional array, like a two-by-two two array stored in row major order, this would correspond to the first row being x0, x1, and the second row being x2, x3. In other words, we have this matrix here. And then the first, next step in the algorithm is we transpose this matrix. So if I transpose this matrix, I end up with this matrix below. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the DFT to each of the rows in the matrix. So the first row in this matrix gets replaced by its DFT. So here we're going to use the formula from the very top of the slide for the, the uh, result of a two-point DFT. So the result of a two-point DFT, you just get the sum of the two elements and the difference between the two elements. So we're going to get the sum of x0 plus x2, which is this guy here, and then the difference between x0 and x2, which is this one here. And then we do a similar thing with the next row. We replace this row by its DFT. So we get the sum of the two elements, x1 and x3, these elements here, and then we get the difference between these elements, x1 minus x3. Any questions so far with any of those steps? Okay. So if we continue along, then we have to apply these so-called twiddle factors. So essentially what we have is a whole bunch of various powers of the fourth root of unity. So in other words, the, like the fourth root of one. Um, so the, the powers here that appear, I've written them out kind of as a kind of explicitly showing the values that I'm plugging in, but essentially like the zero, 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 one, and so on, these correspond to the position in this array. Like this would be row zero, column zero, this would be uh, column one, row zero, and so on. So this is where these numbers are coming from if you go back to the formula, uh, what we're actually plugging in here. So we're basically multiplying by these things. If you multiply by these things, we end up with the result that's shown here. Um, this is just, we have the square root of big, negative one appearing in one of these entries. Um, then once we've done this, we then apply the transposition operation again. So we transpose this matrix and then we apply the DFT along the rows. So we're gonna apply the DFT along this row and along the bottom row. Um, and then again, because it's a two, two by two, we just end up with like the sum and the difference of the elements, uh, which is what we have here. And then at the, the, the last step, essentially, we transpose this matrix to obtain this result here. And then we treat this matrix as if it was a one-dimensional array. And because it's stored in row major order, we would, it would be stored in memory with this element first, then this element second, this element third, and then this element fourth. So if you go over to the next slide, essentially the final result we end up with is just these elements in the order that I read them out of the matrix. And I've written this as a transpose just because if I write it horizontally, it will scroll off the side of the slide. But in principle, it's like a row, row vector. Any questions? Okay, so that's basically the DFT algorithm. And just a few comments on the performance of this algorithm. So the amount of work that's involved, it's an n log n kind of algorithm. Um, you can show this if you go and look at it in a little bit more detail. Um, in terms of the, the cache efficiency, the number of cache misses that are generated, I need to define some of the symbols that are used in the equation below. So we're assuming that uh, L is denoting the number of elements in the array that a cache block can hold, and then Z is the size of the cache in units of the array element size. And if you go through a lot of, uh, a lot of work, you can show that the number of cache misses that you incur is basically order of this expression here. 
And it turns out people have shown that this is kind of optimal, like this is sort of the best that you can do. So in terms of cache efficiency, this algorithm is, is much better than just a naive implementation. We didn't talk explicitly, explicitly about a naive implementation here, but you could directly implement things from the formula, from the formula at the very beginning of this discussion, but it will be much less efficient. It will generate m many more cache misses, misses compared to what we have here. Any questions? Yep. In practice, is there any way to take a piece of code and run it and count how many cache misses you get? Um, there are ways you can do this. I mean, how you might achieve this would depend a lot on the particular platform that you're working on. So some processor architectures actually have hardware registers that count certain types of events, certain types of things that, that happen. And one of them that often is supported is you can you know, count the number of like level one cache misses. And sometimes it even divides it further. Like maybe it's a miss due to an instruction fetch versus a read or a write to data. Um, so if you have a, if you're fortunate enough, you have a processor that provides that kind of functionality, then you can, and, and the way you access it typically is maybe through special instructions in the instruction set. So if you have, if you're fortunate enough that you're using such a processor, then you can use those instructions. And often there's libraries that you can use so you don't have to worry about writing like assembly code yourself. You just use a library that basically provides access to those registers. Um, in cases where you don't have this, then maybe it gets a little bit more tricky to try to do this. I mean, you could also go the route maybe of using some kind of hardware, like simulating the hardware or something like that and using a simulation to try to tell what would happen if you ran the code on that architecture. Mm -hmm. I think on Linux you can also like, run your program with perf as an option that will actually give you the misses, assuming it's the Right, effectively what it's doing is it's using these, these hardware performance counting registers, like on platforms that support it. Because if you didn't have such support, there's not really, like, there wouldn't really be any way for it to know like what values to report. Yeah, but there's some, and actually the, the we're not gonna cover this in the course, but there's like a whole section of the lecture slides that, that talks about like tools that you can use for measuring cache misses and like the, the per, like tools like what you were mentioning is one of them. Um, there's also some libraries that you can use that basically give you access to the, the various different hard, like processor, like hardware performance registers on different uh, processors. And it kind of factors out because different processors, you access this data in different ways but a lot of them provide similar types of data. So there's libraries that, that kind of uh, factor out this machine architecture specific things and just say like, give me the, like, the number of level one cache misses or something like that. And at least if the hardware supports it, it can give those values back to you. Um, maybe in some free future version of the course, maybe I can cover some of this stuff, but I couldn't think of any way to kind of cram it in. There's already enough stuff in here as it is. Um, yeah, but there are ways that you can do this. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well that said then, we're, we're kind of done with the cache stuff and then we're going to the next unit in the course, which is concurrency. So depending on the background you come from, some of the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about will be either review or maybe mostly review, but just to make sure again that everyone's sort of at the same level, I want to kind of cover the, the basic terminology. Um, so processors these days are often multi-core. The actual kind of processing element within the processor is a core. So when we talk about a core, we're talking about something that essentially reads instructions from memory and executes them. It has a bunch of registers, has some kind of arith arithmetic logic unit for basically performing arithmetic and computation, some kind of control unit that kind of drives everything. And then it's typically some kind of cache as well. And then essentially a processor is one or more cores along with an external bus interface to talk to external memory and possibly a shared cache, uh, which is shared amongst the various cores on the processor. Um, then we have what's called a thread. A thread is just a sequence of instructions that can be executed. So it's like essentially each core can execute a, a single thread of execution. Um, some processors, their cores may support what's called multi, uh, simultaneous multi-threading. Um, for example, something sometimes referred to as hyper-threading, where cores core sometimes, a single core can sometimes allow multiple threads to be run on it. Um, but typically resources have to be shared within the core. So it's maybe sometimes that one thread might kind of get blocked waiting for some resource within the core. Anyway, but sometimes you can run multiple threads on a single core, depending on what the processor architecture supports. And just as a matter of terminology, when we talk about a multi-core processor, we're talking about a processor that has more than one core. And most modern processors are multi-core processors. And what's special about multi-core processors is because they actually have multiple processing units, they can actually run you know, instructions, like multiple threads at the same time. You actually get uh, parallelism. A little bit more terminology. So we can talk about a 
homogeneous multi-core processor. This is just a multi-core processor where all the cores are of the same type. And then correspondingly, we have what's called a heterogeneous a multi-core processor. This is one that has more than one type of core. So there might be good reasons for wanting to have more than one type of core. Like one good example would be maybe you want to provide a number of different functionalities on the processor. So you have maybe like, for example, in your cell phone, uh, typically you'll have a, a multi-core processor that has a GPU and a CPU. So for handling the graphics aspects of your phone, the GPU is used for that because it, it's very finely tuned for handling graphics. And then the CPU does sort of the more general purpose processing. So one reason for wanting to have different types of cores is you're trying to provide different types of functionality. Another reason for wanting to have different types of cores might be for providing different levels of performance. And for example, this also sometimes is used for some cell phones and other, lots of other situations as well, um, where you have like two cores, one which is a high performance core, it, it sucks the battery dry very quickly, um, but it, it performs really, like it computes really, really fast. And then you have another uh, CPU core, which maybe is much lower in performance, but it doesn't drain the battery quite as quickly. And the idea is if you're, you know, the operating system can say, well, I'm not doing much computation now, so let's switch over to the low power core because it'll save battery life and we don't really need a lot of processing power right now. And in other times where you need a lot of processing power, then the operating system can kind of switch over to using the, the uh, high performance core, but then the battery gets drained more quickly. Uh, so this would be another example where you might use different types of cores, essentially offering different levels of performance. Any questions? And I just skip over this because I, I guess we kind of covered this in the cache section. So why are uh, processors these days largely multi-core? I mean, you can still find processors that don't, aren't multi-core, but to a large extent, many of them are. At least a lot of the ones where performance, they're kind of much more high-performing processors, they'll, they'll be multi-core these days. Um, the reason why is essentially that, uh, like due to like physical limitations, like the physics of the underlying hardware, um, essentially in the past, like maybe up to about maybe around 2005 or something like that, the way that we got processors to process things faster is we increase, increase the clock rate. Um, so if you increase the clock rate, because the clock kind of drives the synchronization of the chip, if you increase the clock rate, you'll execute more instructions per unit time. Therefore, you increase the computation power of the processor. Around 2005, the clock rates for processors more or less stopped going up in any significant way. And, and the reason for this is that it turns out that if you kind of dig into the physics of things, that the power consumption of the chip grows with the cube of the clock rate. So if you double the clock rate, the amount of power the chip is going to consume goes up by a factor of eight. And because of this kind of growth in the power consumption, it's not practical to keep doubling the clock rate because what happens, like that power that gets consumed, it gets dissipated somehow, typically as heat. And the problem is that if you start dissipating very large amounts of heat, your chip melts or catches on fire. Like you don't want your processor bursting into flame. And even as it is these days, still sometimes some you know, laptops and things have problems with uh, CPUs overheating and so on. Uh, but things could be much worse. We could have major fire hazards and so on if we were trying to you know, increase the clock rates by very obnoxiously large, fac obnoxiously large factors. So essentially the approach we need to take for trying to improve the or increase the computation power of our processors, since we can't increase the clock rate, at least not by that much, because power consumption becomes a problem, power dissipation, heat dissipation. Instead, what we do is we make the observation that we can still pack more transistors onto the, onto the ch chip. In other words, we can still add more processing units. Rather than trying to make them work faster, we just add more of them. And this particular approach is much more viable because the amount of power kind of scales linearly. You know, we have two processor, two, two processor cores, maybe it takes approximately twice the amount of power. Uh, not that we get this kind of much more rapid growth in the amount of heat that needs to be dissipated by the chip. So essentially, instead of having a single core running at a clock rate, which is n times our original clock rate to get kind of n times the processing power, instead what we do, don't change the clock rate at all, but we have n cores. So there's n things doing computation. And because of this, we get an increase in the amount of uh, computational power that we have. So again, the, the main reason for this is due to things like heat dissipation and power consumption. It's just not practical to keep cranking up the clock rate because our, our processors will barbecue and they'll just consume so much power. If you're running off battery, there's not gonna be any battery left in a few seconds. So a little bit more terminology I need to introduce. So some of this relates to concurrency. 
So again, thread, I guess I kind of touched on. A thread is just a sequence of instructions that can be you know, independently scheduled by the operating system. A process is a, a essentially a collection of threads that have some resources allocated to them. The, the main resource would be memory. Threads can't really run without some memory, some address space to run in. But there can be other resources as well, like open files, devices, and so on. So the process is basically the threads plus any resources that they consume. And all of the threads of a single process share the same address space. This is quite important. Uh, then we have concurrency and parallelism. So these mean kind of slightly different things. So concurrency is the idea, when we talk about concurrency, we're talking about that within a given window of time, we're doing kind of multiple things. Uh, whereas with parallelism, we're saying that at the same time, we're doing multiple things. So these are actually subtly different things. Sometimes people kind of equate them with one another, but they're not really quite the same thing. Um, concurrency can be achieved with uh, multiple single-threaded processes. So we have uh, multiple processes, each running one thread. Or alternatively, we could have a single process, which is running multiple threads. And of these two choices, the one that we tend to much prefer is having a single multi-threaded process. And the reason for this is typically we want to be able to share data between threads. And if we put the threads into different processes, then because each process runs in a different address space, it becomes more difficult for threads to share data uh, because they can't directly access data in the address space of the other process. Uh, so you'd have to resort to using some kind of inter-process communication mechanism, like shared memory or message queues or some other mechanism. Uh, but on the other hand, if we have the threads all running in the same process, then they share the same address space, and it becomes very easy for threads to access data from other threads because everything all resides in the same address space. And since we're running out of time, I'm going to stop here for today.